All right, let's move on to talking about generalities with sequences and series. Let me start by reminding you what it means for a series to converge. Here's your series. Summation. Last time we used I as the index of summation, as the book did. Sometimes the book uses N as the index of summation. I personally prefer using the letter K, a lowercase K, which I make cursive because if I make it, what's the word? What's non-cursive? If I make it non-cursive, it looks too much like a capital K. That's my cursive K, lowercase K. K goes from one to infinity of A sub K. Many situations you're going to see a series written with summation notation. You should work at feeling comfortable with that. If you're not, what does this mean? It means A1 plus A2 plus A3 plus A4 plus A5 plus, don't forget the dot, dot, dots. The summation is assumed to go on forever, which brings up a conundrum. How can you sum forever? And my answer is you can't. We're only pretending to add forever and ever. But in spite of our convenient fiction here, pretending to add forever and ever, we can rigorously define what we mean to pretend to add forever and ever. Say, say that again. We can rigorously define what we mean to pretend that we're adding forever and ever. And that turns out to be useful. That convenient fiction, pretending to add forever and ever, turns out to be useful, like it was here. In letting n go to infinity, we were pretending to add forever and ever, because this was the sum. The sum here equaled that when n is finite. By letting n go to infinity, we're pretending to add forever and ever. We get a simpler expression that's useful. It's simpler. <clears throat> get the notation right, get the terminology right. The individual a's themselves are the terms of the series, terms of the series. <clears throat> The sequence of terms, in other words, is just the A's. As an infinite list, it's A1, A2, A3, et cetera, with commas, no plus signs. That's called the sequence of terms. <clears throat> sequence of terms is just a list of numbers. More precisely, it is a function. You could call it a sub k, where the input k is a positive integer. a sub k itself, though, the value a sub k could be any number, integer or not. Could be 7.32965, blah, blah, blah. That's the series. How do you decide if a series converges or not? By definition, you have to look at the sequence of partial sums. The sequence of partial sums. Getting these ideas clear in your mind does matter for your grade, which is not the most important thing. More importantly, it matters for your understanding and hopefully future use. most important thing is that. But yes, it also does matter for your grade. If you can't get these subtle concepts right, it will affect things. So work at it. Think about it consistently as you read, as you work on homework. S1 is just A1. That's called the first partial sum. It's not really a sum. S2 is the symbol for the second partial sum. It's the sum of the first two terms of the series. S3 is the third partial sum. It's the sum of the first three terms of the series, et cetera. Sn is the sum of the first n terms of the series. 
I've got dot dot dot. I've got dot dot dots here, but I am going to stop with an and not put any more dot dot dots after that. In summation notation, write it as k goes from one to n of a k. And I could keep going. This is an infinite list. It's a sequence, sequence of partial sums. <clears throat> Computing partial sums and computing limits of partial sums is in general more difficult than computing integrals and in particular improper integrals that these are analogous to. Integrals are easier. This is harder. Ugh. However, we still can do things with this. Certainly we can do it with geometric series, special kind of series. And certainly it's gonna turn out we can do it with some other special series, the Taylor series that I mentioned 10, 15 minutes ago. Here's the key definition. If Sn, the sequence of partial sums, has a limit, approaches some number S arbitrarily closely, as N gets larger and larger without bound, so we're pretending there's some number S that these Sn's approach, the limiting value of the Sn's is S, just like the limiting values of these things, which I could call Sn, is that they don't ever equal each other, but they approach each other arbitrarily closely as n gets larger and larger. Limits are the key to calculus. Then we say, that the series with the summation sign, and you must, must put the summation sign here. Must, must, must. Don't just put the AKs, okay? Biggest surprise that I encountered in teaching calculus, this, this topic is just realizing people just are super sloppy sometimes and don't bother put, putting summation signs there, for example. But it must be there, otherwise you don't, you don't get it. If you don't put the summation sign here, you don't get what's going on. It's the series we're interested. We say the series converges to S. And we write that the series actually equals S as if we had literally added infinitely many things. There's where the pretending is going on in our, in our notation there. This part is completely rigorous. You can rigorously define what it means for Sn to converge to some number S as N goes to infinity. I, I actually haven't given that rigorous definition because it's, it's more of a real analysis kind of definition for math majors. You can rigorous, rigorously define what this means. And therefore you can rigorously say what it means for a series to converge to S exactly the way I'm saying here. The pretending is in saying, okay, we're gonna hit, say the series equals S even though I haven't literally added up into many things. It's just convenient notation and convenient pretending. It's convenient to write down and, and work with. It's also convenient to use. If on the other hand, SN diverges, if the SNs, if it does not have a limit, does not have a limit as n goes to infinity. We'll see examples here in a second. In other words, the sequence, you might say diverges. Then we say the series also diverges. And we don't say it equals anything. 
Now, there are some situations where some people say in certain situations, maybe when the, when the S ends are going to infinity, that the series equals infinity as if infinity is a number. I did say some math classes, you can treat infinity like a number, though you have to precisely define what you mean when you treat infinity like a number. In this math class, we don't. We're saying infinity is not a number. Here's an example. Sum k goes from one to infinity of negative one to the k plus one power. So this thing here, that is the a k. That is essentially a sequence, not a series. If I were listing out the AKs, A1, A2, A3, et cetera, when K is one, it's negative one squared, positive one. When K is two, it's negative one to the third power, negative one. When K is three, it's negative one to the fourth power, positive one. When K is four, it's negative one to the fifth power, negative one, et cetera. This sequence of terms looks like this and it does not converge. These numbers are not approaching any particular number. They're bouncing back and forth between one and negative one. What does that mean about the series? Does it mean anything about the series? Well, what is the series? If you write it out without the summation sign, it's one plus negative one plus one plus negative one plus one plus negative one plus dot dot dot. Yes, you could write that as one minus one plus one minus one plus one minus one plus one minus one plus dot dot dot. Does that converge? You have to think about the partial sums. This is a must. What's the first partial sum? One. What's the second partial sum? Zero. Yep. Third partial sums back to one. Fourth partial sums back to zero. These are bouncing back and forth and not approaching a limit either. It is a different sequence. These are going back and forth between one and negative one. These are going back and forth between one and zero. They do not have a limit. Limit as n goes to infinity of Sn does not exist dNe. Therefore, the series, make sure you put the summation sign, diverges. That's the reason though. you've got to give reason, a reason based on the sequence of partial sums. By the way, in the, in the previous class, I was having fun talking about a Google and a Googleplex. So I should, I suppose I should talk about that a little bit with you guys. You know, and here, when you're thinking about SN, Typically, we're imagining n being fairly small, like 10 or 20 or 30. But these ideas work even if 10 n is humongous, like a million or a billion or Google or Googleplex. And just for your educational benefit, what is a Google? Not spelled like the search engine, it's with OL at the end. It's 10 to the 100 power, which is a one with 100 zeros after it, which I hope you know, or if you don't, I'm informing you, is bigger than the number of atoms in the observable universe. I'm serious. I think I've read at least they've estimated the number of atoms in the observable universe, maybe even the number of elementary particles in the observable universe is much less than that, like in the order of 10 to the 80th or so. And this is 10 to the 20th times bigger than 10 to the 80th, way bigger. That's how exponents work. Even, you know, it's even 10 billion times bigger than 10 to the 90th. It's 100 times bigger than 10 to the 98th. 
If you wrote numbers in an ordinary size and tried to fit them in some two-dimensional plane in the observable universe, you would not be able to write a Google numbers. That's how big it is. A Google Plex, Google Plex, I believe you can look it up is 10 to the Google power. So that would be 10 to the 10 to the 100. And you could keep going on. You could have like a, a Google Plex 10 there if you wanted to. Yeah, and it's still tiny compared to infinity. Infinity is really big, which by the way is my blog. Infinity is really big advertisement for my blog there. Anyway, I was having fun talking about that with them. So I want to talk about it with you guys too. All right, new example. Series or summation k goes from one to infinity. Uh, let's make it really simple. One. What does that equal? One? No. Realize what it may, means. It means one plus one plus one plus one plus one forever and ever. I hope it's pretty intuitive that that diverges. S1 is one, S2 is two, S3 is three, our old favorite sequence from Wednesday. And Sn is n, which diverges, does not exist. The limit does not exist, I should say. Therefore, the series diverges. Okay, pretty obvious. There's a theorem that says that the terms, the AKs, don't converge. Or in fact, even if they converge, but they converge to something not equal to zero, if AK equals one, if that sequence is one, 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 forever and ever, that converges to one, but one is not zero. There's a theorem that's going to guarantee that such series whose terms do not converge to zero must diverge. It's called the divergence test. In order for a series to converge, the terms have to go to zero, the terms that are being added. However, and this is what makes series both interesting and difficult, just because the terms go to zero doesn't guarantee convergence. The series still might diverge. The most famous example is called the harmonic series. Series, summation, K goes from one to N of one over K. One plus a half plus a third plus a fourth plus a fifth, etc. Don't forget your dot dot dots. Why is it called the harmonic series? Yeah, it's related to music, yeah, scales or something. I don't know the full details. Yeah, scales and octaves and all that stuff is mathematical. Somebody named it the harmonic series and it's stuck. This you should know for the rest of your life diverges. By the time you hit 100, I'm sure I will be dead, but I'll instruct somebody to send you an email saying, if you can answer this question, does this converge or diverge, you'll win some money. Oh, no, sorry. Remember it for the rest of your life. Okay, you should, you really should. It's a cultural thing you might say. You're at a cocktail party in 30 years and somebody says, wasn't the harmonic series great? You're like, well, it was kind of silly because it diverges. You should know that. Everybody should know it. This is in spite of the fact that the terms do approach zero. In spite of, the fact that the AKs, which are each one over K, go to zero as K goes to infinity. Not only do the terms converge, they converge to zero. This still diverges.
The harmonic series is a special case of a more general series called a P series. which if K is your index of summation looks like this, where P is a fixed number, typically thought of as positive because if it were negative, then you'd be adding terms that don't go to zero. So typically you're thinking about this when P is positive so that the terms actually go to zero. Here's a fact you can take to the bank and you probably should remember the rest of your life as well. This converges if P is bigger than one and diverges if P is less than or equal to one, the boundary case is the harmonic series. Proving this can be done with something called the integral test. And that's a topic in section 9.3. Here's what it looks like. Suppose A sub n equals f of n, where f is some function of x, say, but I'm using n as the input. I, I could use k as the input instead of n. I could say, suppose a k equals f of k, the letter used doesn't matter. Where f of x is some decreasing and positive and evidently continuous function because we're going to integrate it. They didn't say it's continuous, but it, it typically is. If this improper integral, notice it's improper integral, the infinity up there, converges, then this series converges. And by the way, the book is being sloppy with notation here. It's understood with the summation that n is going from one to infinity. Although you really could apply it with n starting at zero or two or three or 17 or negative five if your terms were defined, even when n were negative five. It doesn't really matter where you start n. If this integral converges, this series is going to converge. The summation sign though must be there. That's an absolute must. If this integral, if the same integral diverges, then the series diverges. So how would we apply that here, this integral test? We'd have to let this thing be essentially the f of x, except the input's k. That would be your f of k when f of x is one over x to the p. And if p is bigger than zero, the graph of this function, f of x equals one over x to the p is a decreasing and positive function that looks like this. It has the x-axis as a horizontal asymptote. It goes to the point one, one. And I hope you remember from chapter seven, section 7.7, .7, that improper integrals of one over x to the p were known to converge or diverge in similar six situations. Just the first bullet here, this improper integral from one to infinity of one over x to the p converges when p is bigger than one and diverges when p is less than or equal to one, just like the series. So the P series converges when P is bigger than one and diverges when P is less than or equal to one. So you'd be applying that bullet point, which is on page 419 in chapter seven and the integral test, first and second bullet to make this conclusion. But how did we know, for example, with the harmonic series that the improper integral diverged. Let, let me remind you of that calculation. I think we did it before. If P equals one, so we're thinking about the harmonic series and the corresponding function one over X. Let me just remind you of that calculation here real quick. 
By definition, this is a limit. You know, improper integrals are really limits, just like sums of series are really limits. And of course, integrating one over x gives you natural log, right? Technically speaking, in general, the absolute value of x, though that won't matter because both one and b are positive. You get the limit as b goes to infinity of natural log of b minus natural log of one. Natural log of one is zero. This is the limit as b goes to infinity of natural log of b, which does not exist. Some people write it equals infinity, but I think it's better to say it does not exist. It does not exist in a special way. The graph does get arbitrarily large as the input goes to infinity, as it, the input gets larger and larger. The graph of natural log looks like that, say. It will, in spite of the fact that it's increasing a concave down, not have any horizontal aspect. Any horizontal line you draw, no matter how high it is, even if it were up at say a million or even a Google, you're eventually gonna touch that line and even pass it, no matter how high it is. If we're talking about a horizontal line at a million, how big does the input need to be? It needs to be e to the million, which of course is humongous, but that's how big it needs to be. It's still finite. Why? Because natural log of e to the million is a million. <clears throat> and natural log of e to the million plus one is a little bit bigger than a million. That's going to be true no matter how high it is. If the, if the line's at a Google, let the input be e to the Google. So that's a reminder of how you can prove that this improper integral diverges when p is one. And by the integral test, that means this diverges when p is one. And in other words, the harmonic series diverges. Proving this fact without the integral test is possible, but it's not very easy. Integral test is definitely the best way to go. Um, 